We good? You want to start us off? All right, sure. Well, good evening um, to the assembled throngs here at St. Louis Park City Hall. Those of you who wanted to come into the air conditioning from the 80 degree muggy <laughs> weather and gave up yard work for the evening, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Ron Latz, a state senator here. I'm flanked by our state representatives, Larry Kraft and Cheryl Iwakim. And this is our annual post-session town hall. It's an opportunity for us to share our thoughts on session and to hear your feedback on that. Uh, so uh, we are going to uh, have available some online uh, interaction as well. So I'm going to ask uh, Caleb, our staff, to tell us how that's going to work. Hello. For anybody who is joining us online on the broadcast, you can email questions to caleb.roar at house.mn.gov, spelled C-A-L-E-B dot R-O-H-R-E-R -E -E at house.mn.gov. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So I think what we'll do is uh, we'll each take a couple of minutes to, uh, to chat about session, and then we'll open it up. Uh, for the floor uh, for questions and, and uh, we'll just ask you when you come forward uh, if you have a question please come forward to the mics this is being broadcast and recorded it's for rebroadcast to the community so the only way to hear your questions is for you to speak into the microphone so that can it can be picked up on the recording um, so uh, this was the second year of our uh, legislative biennium we completed a budget in the first year that was our primary responsibility uh, this year, um, we had uh, some budget opportunities, uh, which we uh, used to meet some additional needs. Um, and uh, so that consumed much of the session. There is a substantial amount of policy work that was done as well. Um, and there was an effort to uh, get a capital uh, investment bill or a bonding bill done. Um, unfortunately, that one did not come through at the end of the legislative session. Speak louder, you're telling me to? All right, here, I'll pull the mic closer, too. Um, do I need to start over, Caleb, or is we okay? All right, all right. Um, so um, I serve as a chair of the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. We were given um, a target um, of uh, the leadership had gotten together between the House and the Senate. Um, and decided what our overall budget uh, would look like. Uh, we were given sub-targets for our, our particular committee areas, um, and uh, that was uh, most of what I spent my time on in addition to managing um, the, uh, the bill flow uh, through the Judiciary Committee. Um, we uh, had 29 hearings, uh, and we passed almost 100 bills out of committee. Uh, because uh, we have a, a broad jurisdiction. We probably see half the bills that come through the legislature just because uh, maybe not the full subject areas within our jurisdiction, but there's a liability provision or there's a criminal sanction that's involved um, or there's a data practices component, all of which uh, fall within our territory. Um, so part of my job is to not be a bottleneck if I possibly can and make sure um, that uh, bills are able to work their way through the process. Um, in terms of our budget, our primary focus uh, this year was uh, taking care of a Department of Corrections uh, a deficiency, which was uh, to uh, pay for uh, staffing needs and fund the, uh, the, the uh, contract settlements for our Department of Corrections officers. Uh, we were successful in uh, doing that. We now, in our Department of Corrections, for the first time in many years, have been able to get up to 97% uh, fill rate for our positions. Uh, so just about every position that uh, there is in the department is now uh, has staff, which is safer for all the staff and faster, safer for all the people that are in the correctional facilities and also ensures that we have more staff available to provide the kind of services that will make people safer when they return to the communities after they serve their time. Um, we also uh, funded uh, some judiciary needs this year, in particular uh, interpreters. We brought their... Uh, rates up substantially. There was a, a work stoppage because their rates had been falling so short over the years that they weren't able to make ends meet. Um, and we're finding much more attractive, financially attractive alternatives outside of the court system. But of course, these are constitutionally required obligations for the courts to make sure people who are there who don't speak English get the same level of justice that everyone else does. 
Um, and that's not just in the criminal side, but in the civil side as well. So we did that. We did. Uh, we funded the uh, psychological services for people who come into the system with mental health issues that also need evaluation for that. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that we did within uh, the judiciary public safety uh, budget area. Um, and uh, I think that's maybe a bit of a setup uh, for, uh, uh, for what we've done. Maybe I'll turn it over to my colleagues and they can touch on some of their areas of, of focus and attention, then we can open it up. Who wants to go first? By seniority, okay. Representative Yeah, Joaquin. I'm Representative Cheryl Yu Joaquin. I represent all of the city of Hopkins, um, two southern precincts in St. Louis Park, and about a quarter of Edina that's west of 100 and north of 62. I have, this is my 10th year in the House, and before that I was a Senate staffer and a city council member. Um, my husband and I live in Hopkins. We've been there for Oh my gosh, 27 years, 29 years, we raised our three kids there. But in the house, what I got to do this last year and this year um, probably is where I really started in my political um, activity was 23 years ago when ECFE saved my children from me and they were making big cuts. And I got really active and engaged in advocacy work around education, both early childhood through K through 12. Um, that led me to like, what a lot of people do with the PTO and our Legislative Action Coalition group. I ended up on city council and then in the House. And last year, um, I became the Education Finance Chair in a year where we got very lucky, probably once in a lifetime chance that had money on the table and a lot of pent up energy and bills that had been worked on sometimes for years, sometimes for decades. So we got to do a lot of our stuff last year in the first year of the biennium um, from indexing the formula to inflation that we were talking about 20 years ago to um, cutting the special education cost subsidy in half, almost tripling the EL um, per pupil formula. We put money on the formula. We put money into full service community schools. We um, put money into our student support staff to try to get more counselors and social workers and school nurses and um, paras in our classrooms worked on uh, making sure that our kids had mental health supports, universal meals, making sure kids got to eat breakfast and lunch when they're at school because we don't means test for a desk or a book, so why are we doing that for food when that's just as integral part of their education system? Um, this year, like uh, Senator Lott said, it was the second year of the biennium. So since we'd already set the two-year budget, there was a little bit of surplus left, and our leadership got together and figured out how much um, folks were going to get to spend. We had a small um, supplemental budget for education, mostly one-time money, about $43 million. But it enabled us to really build on what we had done um, last year, the year before, which was a big part of that was the READ Act. So our literacy scores have been dropping even before COVID. And we have an amazing uh, representative that just left for county commissioner, Representative Heather Edelson, when she came in six year years ago, started working around literacy, and it was her passion. And she was able to pull together in the room all the experts, even the ones that didn't agree with each other, as well as the teachers and the administrators, and come together and pass the READ Act last year. We put a $100 million investment into that between um, districts being able to find curriculum to train their teachers, and a lot of supports around that. And then this year, we, uh, what we heard and what uh, Representative Edelson heard a lot from the districts was that they needed money to pay their teachers while they were getting trained, either after school or to pay for subs if they were getting pay trained during school. So a large part of that 43 million we got, we spent on the READ Act, building on what we did last year. So we put $37 million more into the READ Act, mostly around teacher stipends. We also pulled some money forward that we had um, put aside last year about, <clears throat> try to remember here, $35 million for curriculum. That wasn't going to go out until December, but our districts really needed that money and more flexibility this year. So that money went out in on July 1st instead with more flexibility for districts to decide what to use for it, as long as it had to do with literacy aid and the READ Act. And then we did, we kind of worked on that bucket, what a lot of committees did, building out what we did last year but also really focusing on how to get more teachers in the classroom and keep more students in the classroom. Um, for the teachers in the classroom, we did a special education um, intermediate um, residency program that our four intermediates wanted to do. And then we also did a one-time, um, sorry, my cousin's in town trying to call me. Um, 
we did a one-time investment in student teacher stipends. So when teachers go um, to school for a four-year degree or even in our alternative programs to get to a teacher licensure program, they usually have to work as a student teacher 10 to 12 weeks in the classroom, which is great. They need that mentoring <clears throat> and ability to practice and see how they can hone their craft. But many times, they're having to give up the job that might be helping them pay for college. Or uh, they just can't, it's almost impossible to do another job while you're doing your student teaching. So we had some one-time money this year. We picked um, some of our public uh, colleges and universities and Augsburg College as well and said, here, we're going to give you money to every, every student teacher you place next year for the 2024-2025 school year in one of our public institutions you're going to pay them a stipend of um, uh, $6,800 for those 12 weeks. And part of it is to see we've had a lot of teachers that will start the program. Um, they'll get their um, education degree, but they won't go on to get licensed as teachers a lot of the times because they can't finish their practicums or they don't finish the test or they realize maybe they didn't have a good teaching experience or uh, teacher student teacher experience. We're hoping that this helps folks finish that. Um, and eventually, if we can put this in place, that it might be a little bit of a way to entice people into the career and maybe have districts, if they want to add to that, use it as a recruiting tool as well. And then when we talk about keeping students in the classroom, you've probably been seeing in the newspaper a lot that absenteeism has started to spike. I think NPR the other day had a story about how parents like, eh, don't know if I need to send our kids to school. So we have a lot of stuff we need to work on with that. but. The absenteeism rates is something that we also decided to work on. Like I said, we had mostly one-time money. So we are doing a demonstration zone in um, different school district in every region of the state. Um, we have cooperative regions, and we utilize those to figure out in that region what was the highest, um, <clears throat> highest absentee rate, but also a district that might have some supports that they want to enhance, and a superintendent or a principal that was willing to hit the ground running so they're getting um, three years' worth of money up front, working in a cohort of 12 other districts from around the state, with Minneapolis leading the, leading the cohort. They're meeting quarterly with each other. They have to give us a report at the end of this year to tell us what they're thinking about doing and at the end of every school year to see how it's going. And we're hoping to see trends out of that that might work. And why it was so important for us to do different regions is because absenteeism, what might help down here in the suburbs, might not help in greater Minnesota. So we are working in Chisholm. i got to think in my head the map now. Chisholm, uh, Moorhead, Red Lake, Wyndham, Mankato, Northfield, um, Minneapolis, uh, Columbia Heights, Cook County, Bloomington, and uh, Blue, yeah, Burnsville, sorry. And then, of course, I'm going to forget the other two. But they're all over the region, and we're really excited about what that might look like. And then we also have one of our committee members, Representative Bakeberg from down in Jordan, and Representative Keeler from up in Moorhead getting together and creating a task. We funded a small task force, absentee task force. He's a principal. She's worked in the schools. They're going to run a task force to also gather that information about absenteeism, what other states are doing that are working, talking to teachers, talking to students. And hopefully between those two things, we come up with some really good ideas to help fund next year. So that's kind of the education realm and what we were able to do this year with just a little bit of money. Um, I also serve on the tax committee. We worked um, some more work on the child tax credit. And then I also serve on Education Policy and the Ways and Means Committee. But I am going to stop talking now so that we can get to Representative Kraft and then get to your questions. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Larry Kraft. This is the end of my first term in the legislature. I represent the 10 of the 12 precincts in St. Louis Park, the, the ones that uh, Representative Joachim doesn't have. Um, I serve as the vice chair of the Climate and Energy Committee. I'm also on transportation, commerce, and sustainable infrastructure. So I'm going to back up at a higher level a little bit. Um, I'll tell you, there's a narrative you may hear about session that it got a little messy at the end. There was a focus on things that we didn't get done. We didn't get a bonding bill done. We didn't get the ERA done. Um, Folks are looking for a public option. Those are some of the things that, that didn't happen. There were a lot of folks who are interested in sports betting. Um, but I will tell you, 
there's a tremendous amount of stuff we did get done. I came out of session, you know, disappointed about some of those things, but overall really positive about the work that we did for Minnesotans. And I think uh, we were probably handing out a, a summary list of accomplishments and, and, uh, and stuff. So you should take a look at that. So even though it was a policy year, and you, you heard this already from my colleagues here, there was some phenomenal stuff done from things like banning junk fees. So this is when you, know, you buy a concert ticket and you think it's 40 bucks, and all of a sudden it's 60 bucks. They're not going to be able to do that come January. They're going to have to put the actual price and, and things like that. Um, did more work on gun violence prevention, on binary trigger bans, and, and making more, uh, you know, this that probably Senator Lass can talk about a lot more. There was a phenomenal packaging and waste bill done by Representative Sidney Jordan that will really get at plastic waste in this state and put the responsibility on the producers of that to actually think about the end of life and being able to recycle and collect that and change how things are packaged. Just plastic is so horrible to our environment and to ourselves and how it's made. And so that is just a tremendous piece of legislation that was passed. Um, and you could see that in all the areas. In, in things that I'm especially proud of that I worked on in the climate and energy space, um, I was a co-author, but we did permitting reform. And this is, you hear about the clean energy revolution that we're in big clean energy transition. Well, we need to build more of the transmission lines, which are the super highways of the grid. And it takes a long time. And so the permitting reform was able was to reduce bureaucracy and make it easier and faster to be able to build those things so that we can make this clean energy transition. Um, I did a bill on something called grid enhancing technologies. Bet you all knew that before you came here, right? Um, but it's actually really cool. It's, it's these technologies that we don't use much in the US but are used outside and you can put them on the grid and in a matter of months and, and with hundreds of thousands of dollars of investment, increase capacity on a line by 10 to 40%. So it's like really common sense stuff that we, we, we put in there. Um, I did some work on energy codes. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really important as we build new buildings that we build them as cost-effective cost as, and as energy-efficient as possible. And so we now, last year I did something on commercial codes, and this year we did residential energy codes. So every three years, the experts in the Department of Labor will work and put together a new set of codes based on international codes based on that, that, are, that come and to, to get us to increasing amounts of energy efficiency. So homes are healthier, more cost-effective, and use less energy. Um, another thing that was done in the, in the transportation space, uh, on, when I'm on the transportation committee, committee. Um, so when we build these, these transmission lines, one of the biggest expenses is finding where to put them. And if you have to run through a bunch of property landowners, you have to negotiate with all of those landowners to, yeah, can I, can I book a transmission line through your land? How much is it going to cost me? Well, what we did is said, look, the primary way we'd like to do this is to put them alongside highways, right? We have right of way there. Um, if we can use that more, more effectively, then you can reduce the impact on other, on landowners and get things built um, faster. And one last thing that I'll talk about, and then we'll open up to questions, and this is probably one of my, well, maybe I'll talk about two things. I did a bill on excavation safety, too. Like, this is like when you dig, you know, call, uh, what is it? Um, is it uh, go for state one call? You call them before you dig? Well, what happens after someone makes that call is incredibly complex and, like, uh, had, doesn't use latest technology. And so I did a bill with the excavation industry to update that. But my probably my favorite little bill was on boat shrink wrap plastic. <laughs> yes, I had to. So, and this is one where a constituent came to me just before actually I started in the legislature and said, I got a boat up north. I get it shrink wrapped in the winter uh, with plastic on it to protect it from the elements because it sits outside. And I used to be able to stick this in a bag and recycle it, and that stopped. And so I just have to throw it out. I looked into this, and we probably use over 6 million pounds of this pretty thick plastic every year, shrink-wrapping boats in Minnesota, and most of that will go into a landfill or get incinerated. 
So we put together a bill, and that's now law, that will require the producers of this to create an organization. It's called a producer responsibility approach. And they'll have to set up a process to be able to re um, collect and recycle this plastic from around Minnesota. So, I mean, I love the bill because it just makes so much sense, but also because this wasn't my idea. It was a constituent's idea. So, you know, when you have ideas and you bring them to us, they can turn into law. So with that, I will uh, stop and I guess open it up for questions. Well, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, maybe before we ask in here, let's turn to Caleb. Has anyone got an inquiry for us online? Not yet. Okay. The lines are open. Call if you wish. And there was just a little weather warning, but not for this area yet. That's what we were hearing when I op when I closed the door. So um, Shamat Habraha, who's my CLA, will be keeping an eye on that for us. Okay, great. So anyone here in the room wish to make a comment or ask a question? Come on up to the podium, please. I have a question about something we haven't talked about. Sure. For a while, this cannabis thing was like a big deal. You know, is it going to be sold all over? We're going to see it on the streets or whatever. And now uh, it seems like they don't have leadership. They don't have a direction. And I wonder if that was addressed at all in session. Do I, demo? I, I can start if you'd like. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is not a significant area of focus of mine. Um, I was always had mixed emotions about this. I've got teenagers and... Um, but I generally feel that it's better that for it to be a, a well-regulated market um, and to you know, try to prevent the you know, bad things from getting put into these, these drugs. Um, so the, it was never intended to be in place by now. There, you're right there. You would have heard that there was someone that was appointed and that was kind of m m you know, mistakes made and then was withdrawn. There is an acting person there who's running the agency and who seems to be doing a really good job. She came before us this year on the Commerce Committee and presented their plans and their thoughts about how to do licenses, and they made some tweaks to the plan. So, you know, I, I got some confidence that things are progressing and that she seems to be, to be competent and working through stuff. It's not without its controversy. There's a lot of folks that, that want to do it one way versus another, but they're, they're, I think they're making progress um, you know, towards it. And so there were some update bills this session, and I think there will be every year. Just as, you know, the, the chair of the Commerce Committee, Chair Stevenson, says, hey, with our liquor laws, <coughs> we update them all the time, and we should expect as we learn more and roll this out that, that there'll be tweaks as we go. Yes, that's uh, Charlene Briner, and she has been in leadership roles for years and really um, is a great person to have there in the interim while they're still looking for um, for a permanent um, commissioner, but as Larry said, there were some tweaks around licensing to um, speed it up a little bit and make sure it's an equitable process. And when people come up, it'd be helpful if you say your name and what city you're from, just so we know too. So, yeah, I would say probably the heaviest lift uh, this year on the cannabis front was the update to how to distribute licenses, uh, and it was not without controversy. Uh, but part of the focus was to make sure that those. Uh, social equity elements of the bill were, of the whole program would be met um, and to set up the process so that it would work effectively. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Matt Kinney. I'm uh, St. Louis Park. I'm uh, in Larry's uh, district. Um, so my question is for Senator Latz. Um, by all accounts, you seem to have been single-handedly responsible for the failure of a bill that would have prevented landlords from discriminating against tenants who receive public assistance, uh, including federal uh, Section 8 vouchers. The reason that you lean on that you don't think a landlord should be required to enter a federal contract in order to rent out their property just doesn't cut it from my perspective. I looked at the paperwork required of a landlord to accept Section 8, and it didn't seem like that big of a deal. It wasn't nothing, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Especially when you compare it to the harm caused by the struggle to find housing that uh, will accept Section 8. And I know about that struggle because I'm helping a friend right now. Well, I was till she luckily found a place. Um, but it's ridiculous. We talked to dozens of landlords until we found one. And it was kind of lucky on our part that we ran into one at, that had a place that was, you know, that worked for her. 
So yeah, you're right. There should be more funding. We should have lots more vouchers. I think we are going to have more vouchers. Um, and so this problem's only going to get worse. Um, you had a chance to help these Section 8 voucher holders, and you turned it down in favor of the landlords avoiding some paperwork. So my question is, how is it that you weren't able to join all 33 of your Democratic uh, caucus uh, colleagues in supporting this bill, and what's it going to take for you to change your position? Well, Matt, thanks for asking the question. I appreciate the opportunity to, to clarify my position. Um, yeah, it turned out, um, by all accounts, that I was the only person who felt that way in particular about this particular provision. Uh, my position's been known for a year and a half. Uh, the authors of the bill uh, knew it from the very beginning uh, when it was first introduced um, a year and a half ago that I was not comfortable with essentially turning uh, private landlords into public housing authorities, which uh, to me, in a lot of respects, um, making it um, a violation of the Human Rights Act, which was the original proposal, uh, to, uh, to not agree to accept Section 8 housing um, would have, have caused every landlord to be uh, discriminatory in that regard. Um, I also didn't think it fit well within the State Human Rights Act. Uh, and yeah, my principal uh, reason for that was I didn't think it was fair uh, for private property owners to be required to enter into a federal contract with all the regulatory oversight and the sanctions that come along with that and the responsibilities and the costs involved in conforming with and complying with federal contracts uh, in order to have the right to rent out their private property uh, <coughs> to tenants. Um, I'm a strong proponent of fair housing. I'm a strong proponent of, of many affordable housing initiatives, and I have been throughout my career. Um, and, uh, but this particular um, aspect, I was not comfortable with. Um, and uh, I don't, I, I've got some ideas on how to improve landlords' willingness to accept Section 8 housing. Um, there are a number of states and communities around the country that have created incentives uh, for what it was intended decades ago when it was first introduced to be a voluntary program, um, what was in, to create incentives for landlords to accept Section 8 housing. Uh, some of those ideas have included reforming the Section 8 program in Washington, uh, which there are discussions going on because they recognize in Washington that this problem is a bureaucratic mess um, and uh, carries with it a lot of additional costs for landlords to participate in. Um, some of the uh, programs involve uh, creating uh, bonuses or, or signing incentives for landlords to accept Section 8 to offset some of their costs. Uh, some of that is to reduce some of the inspections um, that uh, go along with the program. Um, there are a lot of regulatory and financial incentives that can be used to encourage voluntary, continued voluntary participation uh, in, uh, in affordable housing. But there are also um, other uh, initiatives that we've done in Minnesota. We've put hundreds of millions of dollars into building new affordable housing. Uh, we've initiated a, a state of Minnesota program um, that uh, will also provide subsidies uh, for housing uh, for those who qualify financially for those subsidies. And that program is in the process of ramping up now. So I'm hoping uh, that those will make it more accessible for people um, who need the financial assistance. Um, and we should also uh, make sure that we are in a position to provide additional services for people who uh, do come in with vouchers or with other forms of public subsidies for housing to make sure that they have the ability to stay in a stable environment uh, once they do get into housing as well. Thank you. I, I, I still I think we're going to have to disagree. I think you're, you're too much on the side of the landlords and not giving enough weight to the, the struggles that it is for the people with the vouchers to find a place. I, I, maybe you, I don't know if you've talked to any of them lately, but uh, it's, a real, it's a real problem. Uh, well, and I understand that, and uh, I'm sure it's a, it's a very uh, difficult issue for people who are looking for a place to stay. Um, but at some place, we've got to have a balance between what government mandates on private property owners um, and uh, what they leave to the private market. Uh, so I have no problem at all with the concept of providing uh, public subsidies uh, for housing, of, uh, however that is uh, characterized. Um, but there are an awful lot of, of uh, mandates out there now where government is making it very, very difficult for, uh, for private property owners to comply with a whole host of regulations. Um, we've, in the last couple of years, we've passed uh, changes 
to how long it takes uh, for um, uh, landlords to be able to evict a person who or a renter that's not paying their rent. Um, there's a proposal now in St. Louis Park to, to consider uh, a 30-day waiting period, which would turn out to be about two months um, once you put in the time of going through the process and all the notices. Uh, so, and those are costs which are borne by the property owners who aren't getting paid for the property that they are renting out to someone who's got a contract uh, to pay to live in, in that private property. Uh, so I think we struck a pretty good balance. We've passed um, probably maybe a dozen and a half, maybe more um, housing initiatives to uh, strengthen tenants' rights. Uh, we passed an initiative this year to give tenants' rights organizations the opportunity to, to organize um, in, in uh, private property. Um, and uh, we've, over the course of the last year and a half, we passed an awful lot of uh, pro-tenant legislation. This particular piece with regard to Section 8 housing, I disagree with, that's all. Well, thank but you. Thanks for bringing I, it we'll, up. I we'll be talking that. more about that. No problem, Matt. I'm sorry to keep my head in my phone. Of course, I forgot my iPad at, at home in a hurry to get to step the step fundraiser before this. Um, and I was trying to find Representative Extra, uh, Esther Agbaje's um, tenants' rights bill to list off some of the stuff that we did to help with tenants' rights um, with, like, timely repair and um, notices. And so we did a lot of good work. But really, we do need to spend a lot more money in affordable housing so that folks have a choice between all the different avenues they can. Um, many of us have, I, you know, I don't know how folks you have, if you have a starting teacher trying to find even a place to rent with how much the rent is here. I think the average rent in Hopkins for a one bedroom is around $1,100 and in St. Louis Park it's about $1,400. So teacher start, starting salaries are around 37000 um, makes it tough to have a car, get insurance, find a place to live, make bills, and, and pay back school loans. So it's very hard, especially for our frontline workers, to find housing. Um, that's a real big, uh, real big issue. We've done a lot of investment, but it also takes a lot of coordination between the county, the federal government, the state government, the local government, and local municipalities, and then also a lot with both our nonprofit developers as well as our for-profit developers and trying to figure out how to, how to make that, those dollars work and their perspectives work when they put together a project. I'll uh, add into this topic a little bit on the housing side. One of the um, bills I carried this session that, that didn't make it was around housing. Um, and it was, you may have heard re referred to as missing middle housing. Um, and this is workforce housing or starter homes. Um, if you're looking to downsize, you know, that kind of thing. There's just not that much available. We have a huge deficit in Minnesota, especially in this area. And so the bill I carried was aiming to make some statewide changes um, and to push cities to do more, to allow more options in zoning um, and things that were previously allowed that have grown over time to not be allowed. Um, so we have to do more. We have to uh, look at, at subsidies and, and things like that. But we also, um, we can't just subsidize our way out of this deficit. So we need to really think more broadly about how we allow housing options and, and also it's important to do it in a way that doesn't uh, doesn't condone or push out more sprawl. Like like from you know I, as as many may know, I, I come into this work with a climate lens, and we have to build a lot more housing. But if we build it in the wrong places, we will make our transportation emissions problem a ton worse. And not only that, even if you're say, well, I'm not sure that that's an issue I resonate with. Um, it should resonate is, can't we do things so that people have to drive a little bit less in living their lives? Who doesn't want to spend 10 or 20% less time in traffic, right? So if we can think about where we build things, how we evolve housing, so that it's easier maybe to walk to a grocery store or to a restaurant or to bike if you want to. Um, we, we can do those things in, in the way so that over the next 10, 20 years, our trends are going in the right direction versus more sprawl, more you know, more farmland being paved over, more forest being paved over. So 
that was the the bill I had this missing middle housing bill. It was very controversial because it it um, it would uh, preempt some city work, um, and uh, so it didn't make it through. But we're going to talk a lot with cities, and we've learned a lot because I think it's the right kind of direction. And we'll see about coming back next year with something um, where we've taken the learnings that we had this year. Other questions, or even just topics you'd like us to talk about. Hi, my name is Fred Olson. Um, I would just like to know what some of the shorter, short-term and longer-term consequences are of not having a bonding bill. And, um, and I guess one area in particular, how does it affect housing? Hmm. Well, luckily, we still made some major investments in housing last year in the tax bill, as well as now we have a housing committee. They spent about $50 million more in housing this year. But bonding bills are important not just for housing, but for our infrastructure around the state, um, for our infrastructure at our universities, for our road infrastructure, for our, um, water safety, water infrastructure. So it is important. We. We had to play catch up last year. There hadn't been a decent bonding bill passed for a few years, so last year was a, a larger bill than we usually pass in a non-bonding year. I was um, particularly disappointed that we didn't get one across the finish line this year, especially uh, Chair Lee in the House had put together a really strong package <coughs> with uh, Minority Lead Representative Erdahl um, that we just didn't get traction on, and it had a bonding bill in um, for St. Louis Park. It had a bonding bill for the very first bonding bill Hopkins was going to have a cancellation from another project moving to them and a bonding bill um, for Edina too. So we kind of lost out on that the last minute. It, the one that did pass the house floor was drastically stripped down that didn't have as much projects in it. Pretty much bare necessity projects that got sent to the Senate It just like with like 30 seconds shy of being able to pass it in the Senate. So. Um, I think we're in a good place and there's been a ton of work done this year and that we had a really good bonding bill last year. But it is something that you want to stay consistent on, especially when we still have really good uh, bond ratings right now, when we let bonds and where the economy is at with the interest rates going down, that um, it would have been nice to have one this year. Long term, I think it's something that we really have to be consistent on um, so to get to get that expectation, and also for our construction industry to count on those jobs. Uh, so, you know, the, the bonding bill is, um, it's an opportunity to invest in infrastructure, and there are a lot of communities that need the, the state support, the borrowing authority from the state, as well as the financial investment to be able to do that. And that's from wastewater treatment plants that goes, uh, toward uh, transportation infrastructure, it, it goes toward uh, water supply lines, it, it goes toward community centers and, and uh, uh, safety structures in communities, it goes toward uh, rebuilding intersections and, and all sorts of things. Uh, and uh, it's the one bill that requires a super majority in the legislature, which except in very unusual years requires bipartisan support out of the House and out of the Senate. Um, it also means that the minority parties have a lot of negotiating leverage because they want to trade their votes for other things that they would also like to see accomplished in the legislature. Um, we had about a $980 million bonding proposal um, out of the, uh, the majority party. It was a great bill, Senator Pappas and, and uh, um, and the House put this uh, proposal together. Um, and unfortunately, the, uh, in my own view, uh, the GOP minority played hardball for too long and too late um, and weren't willing to come together. And part of the problem uh, was that there was just a lot of time spent stalling so many of the other work that needed to get done that there, we ran out, they ran out the clock, basically. Um, was my view of it, uh, and it's true. We had about a $95 million cash bill that uh, the House passed um, uh, toward the very end, um, and by the time uh, it got to the Senate and because of the, the uh, challenges on the floor <laughs> in the Senate, uh, literally we ran up against the midnight constitutional deadline to adjourn. So uh, that one could not get across the finish line. Uh, but, you know, 
One of the reasons the bonding bills are so important now is because there were a number of years when we didn't pass bonding bills, when interest rates were low, when unemployment was higher, um, and we could have gotten a lot more out of every dollar that we invested. Uh, because there is a there is a side of some people in the legislature that feel just so conservatively about spending public dollars, even in these kind of investments. Um, that <coughs> there are always a no on these bills. And then it's a big political jockeying as to making sure you get enough projects in a bill that everyone is satisfied and they feel that they're getting something out of it as well. Uh, so it, it's a real trick. Um, I shouldn't say a trick. It's a real skill for the leadership to be able to put a bonding bill together. And it gets always gets caught up in the end of session negotiations over what's going to pass, what isn't going to pass. And unfortunately, it fell victim to that kind of uh, process this year. I don't have much to add other than I would say, you know, some communities are going to have to postpone things where they're just not able to do it. Others may be able to go forward, but will rely more on their taxpayers, more on property taxes than maybe they would have liked to. Um, so I think, you know, in, in terms of specific impacts, um, that, that's what I would see. My name is Savannah Dowdle. I'm a Vidina under Representative Joachim. I'm here to talk about the Survivors Justice Act. Um, this was first introduced in the 2021 and 2022 legislative session, and it did receive approval from the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Committee. Um, it was then sent to the House Committee of Judiciary Finance and Civil Law, but it did not get a hearing. So I'm coming to you guys today to speak of the future potentially for next year as I intern with Violence Free Minnesota. So the Survivors Justice Act would be advocating for shortened sentences for people convicted of crimes as a result of domestic abuse, sexual assault, or sex trafficking. It also asks judges to consider experience experiences of violence prior to sentencing given the psychological effects of abuse um, and on the second page is really where community impact so in 2022 stephanie clark of maple grove was sentenced to 25 years in prison after shooting and killing her boyfriend who had threatened to kill her and her five-year-old son after a long history of abuse had the Survivors Justice Act already been adopted, survivors like Stephanie, who acted to protect herself and her son, could have avoided further victimization through the legal system. While Stephanie's conviction was overturned by the Minnesota Court of Appeals, the trauma further inflicted on her family, including her son, who has moved to foster care, is not soon forgotten. Um, I'm really hoping that Representative Joachim, we could maybe have you as a co-author. I am in contact with Athena Hollins, who was the original uh, main author of this in 2021. And Senator Latz, I would love to talk with you more in the future um, if we get this to the State Senate to get a hearing. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Savannah, for bringing this to our attention. Um, I'm not specifically familiar with the proposal, um, and I know that under current law, uh, there are some provisions for factoring and mitigating uh, circumstances in sentencing, uh, and sentencing guidelines um, require that under certain circumstances, but uh, I'd certainly be willing to have a conversation with you and to look more in detail into this proposal. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to meet with you too, and I'll talk to Representative Hollins. All right, come on down. Yeah. <laughs> it's a decent turnout. I'm glad we got some people here. So, yeah. uh, My name is Kevin Matson. I'm from St. Louis Park. I'm in uh, Representative Kraft's district, and I've attended some of his, uh, I've attended the ice cream social with you recently. So uh, I'm going to ask about, first of all, actually, really, I want to thank the whole DFL legislature for so much work in the past couple of years. I really, I think that the, yeah, I think that they've, 
think that really that we you know we found a good balance for Minnesota overall. I know things aren't perfect, and that we have we have a state of six million people, and a lot of a lot of people have different priorities. But I really I'm happy with the movement that we've seen. So thank you guys for all the work. I know it's not easy. I know it's sometimes a thankless job. So thank you. Um, I want to talk about sports betting, if possible, and the tie-ins with the um, with the horse tracks. Um, I'm an employee at Canterbury Park. I've worked there 22 years, and um, I can't say enough positive about them as a corporation. Um, they, I know this is a complicated issue. I know that um, you know there have been years of legislation around this, or years of talk around this, and legislation related to gaming. And um, you know, I'm happy to talk with anybody one on one. I'm happy to test. I'm not a. Rep I'm not here representing Canterbury Park. I'm here just because I live in the district. Um, so I'm. I'm sure they have lobbyists working. Maybe they've talked to you. I don't know. It doesn't. You know, we don't have the track here in our district. Um, but, uh, you know, I know around sports betting, there's clearly a lot of, speaking about the cannabis regulation and some of the other um, regulation, there's clearly a lot of illegal sports betting happening. And to me, any of those things seem like um, they're better off regulated, managed, and um, making sure that people aren't being taken advantage of. So my hope is that we can work something out that does involve Canterbury Park. I'm sure that I'm sure that the Canterbury Park lobbyists have said that also. Um, but I just want to speak to the quality organization that they are. Um, and I've been there 22 years. They, uh, they're always thinking about their employees, and um, I can't say enough good about them. But if you could talk a little bit about the sports betting legislation, I know that didn't happen this year or what might be coming online in the next couple of years. I expect to, I'm in Larry Kraft's district, but um, I expect to support you guys through this year and the whole DFL leadership as we go through. So um, maybe you can touch on that. So. Well, Kevin, thank you. Uh, I support the sports betting proposal. Um, it's a product of many years of work. And I think if, if it's an unusual coalition that would have to come together to pass it. If it had gotten a floor vote in the Senate, it would have passed this year. I can't speak for how the numbers looked in the House. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's uh, opposition to it fell along different lines than purely partisan caucuses. Uh, there were strong uh, elements within the uh, the Democratic Party that had um, objections to it, um, and there were strong elements um, on the more conservative side of the Republican Party had had objections to it as well. Uh, so, and uh, but I think there was a larger group of us in the middle uh, that were comfortable with it. Uh, the last proposal that I saw, um, and we did hear it in the Commerce Committee that I also serve on. Um, uh, included uh, money that would go to Canterbury and would go to running aces um, as well uh, to help offset some of the impacts um, that it might have on them. Um, it uh, did preserve uh, the tribal primacy um, with regard to the overall compact that we've had for betting and gambling in Minnesota for decades uh, to uh, make up for the hundreds of years of, of uh, unfair treatment uh, to our tribes. Um, but I thought it struck a good balance, and you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a lot of betting that's already going on right now online, uh, and, uh, and it's unregulated in Minnesota. Um, some of the, the pressure points were around the questions of do you allow betting in the middle of a game, for example, or not? Uh, or do you have to place all your bets um, before the game starts, and then you just let that ride? Turns out about 50% of all the revenue in sports betting is from in-game gambling while the game is going on. Uh, so there are a lot of different dynamics involved here. I personally view a gambling as uh, a uh, entertainment dollars that people choose to spend and ought to be able to spend as they wish. I don't have a moral objection to it. Well, we think back to uh, church basement bingo, uh, you know, as a form of, of uh, gambling, if you will. Um, and uh, uh, so I don't have the moral or religious objections to it. Um, but I also think it does have side effects, um, and they're very real, and I've seen the impact on families uh, from gambling addiction as well. And that's where a lot of the moral objection comes from and the practical objection comes from is the side effects. And no matter how much you fund efforts to help protect against that or to deal with the addictive side of things, you, you're, you're still trying to put together lives that have been torn apart by it. Uh, so it's a pretty negative side effect. Um, but in the overall balance, 
Um, my own view is uh, people should have a right to spend the money as they wish, and we're better off if we're regulating it and trying to put some guardrails around it um, than, than not. So that's my personal view. I was going to add, I'm supportive of it too. I think they were really, really, really close at the very end. Representative Stevenson and Representative of Garofalo had, like, if they would have had, like, a whole nother day, I think it would have possibly gotten across the finish line. I think we needed more votes from the GOP in the House because we had fewer DFL votes in the House. But I know it's something that's been... I going, you know, being worked on for a long time. And personally, I would rather Minnesota eyes it before it just kind of happens to us. So um, my hope is that um, we continue to, you know, have that work on. Representative Garofalo, unfortunately, is retiring. <laughs> so I'm hoping there's some bipartisan mantle that can be um, picked up again um, when it comes to that. But it, is, it has been taking a lot of discussions and a lot of time to get something done that, unfortunately, should have been a little bit easier. Yeah, and Kevin, you and I spoke about this, and I really appreciate you coming to me and giving me your view of Canterbury. That had an impact. I went out and and spoke to Representative Tabke, Brad Tabke, which is, you know, he's the representative where Canterbury is, and just to let him know that I got some very favorable impact uh, views and just to keep me in the loop on it. So I know he is working hard to try to get a, a, a fair deal for Canterbury. Um, I also am... I'm in the vein of I think it's better off regulated versus illegal, especially if you look at how many other states have it and everyone else around us does. Um, you know, I I uh, I am concerned about the impacts of it, and and so I, I like the fact that in the bill was thinking about that and how you do provide some education and support um, for folks that um, that go down the you know maybe the wrong path with gambling. Um, so, I, again, I really appreciate it. I think it got very close. Uh, I know Representative Stevenson was pulling his hair out over it the last uh, couple of days, and um, I'm not sure what will happen next session. I imagine it will, it will come back. Can I make one more comment on that? Is this, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have any idea what the Canterbury management has proposed or not proposed, but I, first of all, I'm very sympathetic to the problems related to gambling. I think that that is a clear... Um, something that we need to keep in mind. I think Canterbury has done a very, very responsible job as a company. Um, they have signage all around. Their limits are lower than many of the, the tribal um, the tribal casinos, so people have a harder time making large bets. Or it's, it doesn't prevent people from gambling, but it, it prevents somebody from losing a, a large amount in one fell swoop of gambling. Um, I, I don't know where they would be at with this, but um, it seems like to putting something in that could possibly use some revenue through Canterbury to fund some of these other priorities that we've talked about. I don't know that our DFL priorities. Um, I have no idea if that's something that one of you could bring to the attention of the lobbyists or if they've thought about that or how that comes together. But I think they would do a really good job of managing something, even like a sports book on property um, that I don't know exactly. I know the tribes have really leaned on running the sports books themselves but um but yeah and I, and I don't i don't have i think the tribes have clearly to speak to senator last your point i mean there's been hundreds of years of injustice to the native american communities in minnesota and across the united states so i am sympathetic to that and i do think that um you know again the mix the mix of these issues and trying to put together the pieces of things that happened long ago versus what's happening now and the people the people involved, I think that you guys are doing a very good job. I appreciate the work. And so um, if there's anything I can help with, or let me know. Thanks. Thank you. And I'll just uh, tag on to one comment that you made. Um, I, I'm not comfortable with the, the pro sports spending argument that it's going to bring in additional state revenue that can be used for a variety of purposes. That would be a salutary benefit. And I think if, if we do it, then the state ought to receive, you know, some tax revenue from the economic activity like or, or the comparable uh, uh, notion. Um, but in terms of looking at it as this is a way that we can spend, you know, bring in revenue to spend on other priorities, um, I'm not comfortable with that link personally. Um, but uh, for the other reasons, I think it's, uh, it's valuable. And, and I, I think it is fair uh, for, the, for the tracks, Running Aces and, and Canterbury. Um, to receive some revenue in connection with this whole enterprise. Um, I'm, I'm not comfortable turning it over to them.
to be the primary operators or just another site uh, for it because of the history of gaming um, and the history of uh, the Native American community in Minnesota. Thank you. So, Thank you for the comments. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Judith Moore, St. Louis Park. I'm here for transportation. <laughs> I, walk, I drive by the parking lots and they're empty, absolutely empty, and I do not think that 100% of the people now are working from home. I think our transportation system is inefficient, dangerous. I, if I could ride the bus downtown and have a reasonable idea when that bus was going to come back, I would do it. But we have just a fouled up system. I don't know who's running it, but we need to do something. Because I know where Larry's coming from in the transportation. We can't all get in our cars and drive someplace. But if we don't have a way to get there without driving, we're up a crack. So thanks. What I would um, thank you, Judith. I absolutely agree. We need more investment in our transportation and in our transit and active transportation infrastructure. So one thing that we did do last year, which will will which should make this better over time, was um, we put a three quarter cent sales tax in the seven county metro area for transportation. And of that three quarter cent, three quarter it's um, uh, five eighths of it. So almost all of it is for transit. A small portion is for roads and bridges. And there's a small portion in there that's for active transportation. So it equates to for uh, for transit 450 to 500 million a year and then it'll, that'll increase over time and about 25 to 30 million for active transportation so that will start um, having an impact um, now and going forward and i think you also kind of hit the nail on the head that our our transit system has had to kind of right size and retool when the market changes with people going downtown to work or those that aren't and then also adjusting around when light rail opens, we, you know, bus, RTO, bus rapid transit is a great option too. And how do we do that, like what they always call that last mile mm -hmm. for people to be able to use transit that might not live right by a station but want to. Um, Hopkins, uh, when I, I worked downtown for a little bit a few years ago, and they seemed to be like a, a, a dead spot when it came to transit for a bus. If you didn't catch the first two express buses in the morning, um, that all both came before like 7.15 a.m. And those still took 30 minutes to get downtown. It was 40 to 45. I used to put my bike on the bus so that I could bike home, I could bike home faster than I could get home with transit. So we ha yeah, we have to, we have a lot more work to do. I'm just gonna chime in. If anyone is watching online and has a question, um, you can email it to caleb.roer, which is C-A-L-E-B dot R-O-H-R-E-R -E at house.mn.gov. So we still have more time, so if anyone's listening and has a question, send it in. And we could follow up on the transportation issue. Uh, one of the things that uh, we did pass this year was an Uber Lyft bill, um, which uh, on the merits, where it ended up, I think was a good place. Um, and uh, it was uh, much better than the proposal that uh, stalled out with the governor's veto last year in 2023. Um, and uh, it uh, put a lot more protections in place for drivers, and some due process in place for drivers, and, and more affordable uh, uh, wages uh, uh, for drivers, but still at a level that the companies. Um, are going to be able to continue to serve and, and uh, make money as a as private enterprise in uh, the state of Minnesota and provide the services that um, not only a lot of a lot of people perhaps in this room use, but uh, very heavily depended upon by the disability community, um, some of the uh, the worker community that don't have vehicles but don't work hours where our buses or mass transit are are helpful, so they get to and from late night hotel shifts um, and stuff like that. Um, so, unfortunately, the way that played out in terms of getting to the end product uh, took up almost the entire day on the Saturday before the legislature was going to adjourn. And the entire agenda was being held hostage to that one proposal uh, in the Senate 
anyway. Um, well, the leadership took about eight hours that day to uh, reach an agreement. So um, that was just one of those bottlenecks that uh, created all sorts of trouble at the end in terms of getting other stuff passed. Um, but as I say, on the merits, we ended up in a good place. And I think that was important. And I, I uh, kudos to everyone who worked on it, including the governor, um, who uh, rolled up his sleeves and got heavily involved um, in that as well. Sure. Come on up. I'm Nancy Reed of Durham Duck on Northwest Corner of Edina. So you, Akeem, and Ron. Um, so many things were blocked because of this gridlock and dysfunction between both sides of the aisle. And it, it comes to me that is there any effort or do you see any path that as long as that's happening, your best efforts are going to be thwarted? So more or less to get to the root of the problem, I mean, we have a lot of resources in Minnesota. Uh, Better Angels will get people together. NPR, I think, has a program for how to have difficult conversations. I think if that would be addressed, it would improve so much. I think you're right, and I've done the Better Angels workshop, and we have a civility caucus that works both in the House and the Senate that does that. But I think a lot of it comes down to us as individuals being willing to work across the aisle. Like as a chair, I still work every week. I'm meeting with minority, my minority lead to you know let him know what's going on, see what bills he wants to bring forward, trying to figure out how we can approach education together. Um, this year, they didn't introduce a lot of bills. I wish they would have introduced more that we could have worked on together. But And he didn't vote for the education bill, but I still put him on the conference committee because his voice was important to have be there. So I think it also takes individuals to get you know, roll up their sleeves and work together. Um, a lot of that stuff is done behind the scenes. <coughs> and this year it was done a lot more as bills were being put together versus bills already when they were in committees since it was the second year of the biennium. Bills had already started to be worked on last year and um, things were adjusted as they moved through. At the very end of session, I was working on a bill that came in late from the governor's office to create a, um, put, give more tools to the Office of Inspector General in um, at Minnesota Department of Education to um, have those tools to prevent something like feeding our futures again. And I worked across the aisle with a represent uh, minority lead, Cresha, and Representative. Um, oh my gosh, my, he's up in Blaine and uh, Nolan West. I was like, his um, name left me for a sec. Sorry, my husband's up where there's a tornado, so I'm trying not to look at my phone. <laughs> he's visiting his parents right now up by Maryfield. Um, but no, I think it takes a lot. It takes the individual people to actually step up and do it as well. Sometimes, unfortunately, um, I love committee work because committees were, you know, before committee and committee are, and putting together those bills are where the work is really done. Sometimes the floor ends up just being show. And I think over the last few years, it's almost become like as much show as social media is, unfortunately, instead of each other looking at each other and talking to each other as humans, it's about what sound bite you can get. And until that kind of whole culture changes a little bit, I do worry a lot about that. And I, frankly, I worry a lot about what we're teaching our kids when we behave that way, so. I, I wanna, so I, I agree with that and I can see how it is, the, how it seems especially when you hear end of session got, but I gotta tell you, um, I think that's also a lot of what the media focuses on. You know, my first term, so I don't know how it's evolved, but I have a lot of really good relationships with folks on the other side of the aisle and work with them on bills. And even bills that they're not gonna vote for, there's, typically some kind of input from Republicans that you take and it makes it better. Now, I'll give you an example. I had this little bill passed last year, climate action grants for local units of government. It's a, a few million bucks so that cities that want to plan for climate action for, or for adaptation are able to do it. Well, one of the guys in our committee, Representative Spencer Igo, no way he's gonna vote for this, but he said, what have you done to make sure that enough of this money goes to greater Minnesota, that it's not all soaked up by folks in the metro area? And I said, you know what? 
I think that's a great, your great point. Is there language you've seen that I can put in that would do that? And he sent me stuff, and I put it in, and that went into the bill. So that'll never come out as, as an, you know, you'll never see that, but that happens all the time. Um, I'll also say that, uh, that the way this, the system is set up, right, we're a part-time legislature. We only have a certain amount of time to get things done. And if, if it doesn't happen by that time, it doesn't get done, right? And there are no debate limits. So if you're in the minority, you can talk and talk and talk, right? And at some point, the majority... You either come to some agreements, okay, you're going to limit the talk, or you're going to, you know, we're going to do what we need to do. And we have tools to do that. And what you saw at the end of session was, from my perspective in the House, there was a lot of delaying happening. The, the bills that we put together at the end of session and passed had been debated on the House floor, not even talking about committee, on the House floor for 52 hours already, Okay. There was one bill that spent almost eight hours, the junk fees bill, which was a bipartisan bill, and most of that time was talking about hamburgers, right? Yeah. At some point, the minority has a right to talk and be heard, absolutely. But the majority also has some rights too, right? And, and we have rights and responsibility to govern. So I, I know how it seemed at the end, but there's, I mean, just an hour before you know, everything went nuts. We had a really positive moment on the floor when the Wolves won. Like I, I did a personal point of privilege and asked a Republican colleague who was like clearly elated to tell everyone what happened. And we all, you know, so, so there's a lot more behind the scenes positive things happening than you would see. And I think, um, you know, the idea of debate limits or some way of thinking about the structure, because the structure sort of encourages this at the end of session, this conflict, um, to happen, but so as a first termer, that's my view. I, I come away not discouraged by have, having spent a term in the legislature. More, I, I'm encouraged. I mean, yeah, there's stuff we need to change, but we did some phenomenal stuff, um, and and uh, this session too. Um, so a lot of stuff worked um, in the end for Minnesotans, uh, even if it got a little bit messy. Yeah, we're one of the few states that don't have debate limits, and I think that, I mean, um, Majority Leader Long had kind of proposed them in the beginning because um, Minority Lead uh, Damoth was newer. Um, our Speaker of the House had decided, like, let's just wait and give her a chance to run her caucus before we do that. Um, I think there's a little bit of regret about that, about the sixth hour of the hamburger debate. Um, and at, literally, it was eight hours about hamburgers on a bill that they voted for. So it was very frustrating. Um, and in this House, we also have a 24-hour rule for amendments that helps both sides of the aisle get together and talk about them ahead of time and try to figure out you know, that one last stop that we can make a bill better um, before it gets. I'm a big, like, the more committees it goes through, the better the bill gets because there's more eyes and more comments and more public input into it. But um, we do, after this year, do have to change something. But we have the rules to do what we did. Um, and it, you know, we still got a lot of great stuff passed because of it. So I'm going to agree with both of my colleagues. Um, there is a lot of bipartisan work that gets done, uh, especially in the committees. Uh, and uh, I mean, I can tell you who in the Senate across the aisle for me are terrific in terms of analyzing bills that come before the committee and proposing solutions, in offering amendments, in trying to bring stakeholders together, in improving legislation. Um, and uh, there are a number of bills, um, in, say in the Judiciary and Public Safety Bill, you know, we did an omnibus bill, it, it passed as a standalone bill on the, um, on the Senate floor on uh, the Sunday um, of, of, uh, of adjournment. Um, and uh, probably two-thirds of the proposals that were in there were bipartisan in nature, that were non-controversial, the broad consensus that they were good uh, uh, public policy to enact. There were some things in there that were quite controversial, of course, um, and uh, that generates the flashpoints. Uh, but when we assemble these larger bills, there are a bunch of smaller bills that have come through the process um, along the way. And, and there are bills, for example, that you know, will come before our committee and it's pretty clear there isn't a consensus yet, even among the stakeholders, let alone you know, uh, the partisan 
uh, members of the committee, and I'll say, uh, we're not going to lay it over. You stakeholders and everyone get together and talk some more. Uh, and uh, if you can come back together and reach a, an agreement, then uh, we'll bring it back up and we'll move the bill forward. Um, I have a follow-up question. I mean, what's yeah. the second time to work together for that? Because you have to have uh, Well, the, the question uh, is, what's the tripping point? If we're working so well, but we can't get things across the finish line, what's, what's the trigger point? Well, um, the fact is we, we, we work in an environment where there are some very stark differences in values and in philosophies as well. Um, and they tend to play out in, in uh, some bigger ways. Um, that doesn't mean that a lot of the stuff can't get passed on its own. Uh, but you know, when we are measuring the amount of time we have to get things passed, and when some of those big trigger point disputes end up taking up <laughs> hours and hours of floor time, um, we're left with a real challenge to try to get the other stuff done. Um, so, uh, I mean, I will, um, the Senate this year spent more overnights debating bills um, than we have in my 20 years in the legislature. Is that necessary? Uh, it's not necessary. It's absolutely not. And I can tell you part of the dynamic in the Senate is that there are five or six uh, new members of the Senate knew this term, meaning in the last two years, they came over from the House, actually. Um, but uh, they believe that long-winded discussions, debates, conversations, and frankly, being as much of a fly in the ointment or sand in the gears as possible for the majority is a productive use of their time and our time. And it slows everything down. I can tell you a lot of members of their own caucus really dislike those senators because of that approach. Um, and we don't have the parliamentary tools that we should have to be able to limit debate. Um, and I we have to look at some rule changes because as, as Representative Kraft said, I mean, the minority has a right to be heard. Sometimes all they have is their, is their voice, but the majority has a responsibility to govern as well. Um, and we have to have enough uh, tools at our disposal to make sure we can govern. Um, we did, um, passed some other great stuff. And if we look back, especially over the last two years, uh, we passed the uh, uh, To Protect Reproductive Freedom uh, with the uh, Protect Reproductive Options Act, the PRO Act. Um, this year we passed the Minnesota Voting Rights Act, which is a, a big piece of legislation that will uh, protect against voter suppression efforts. Um, last year we passed a child tax credit, uh, which has reduced child poverty by, was it about a third, I think, in Minnesota? I mean huge impact um, on people. Uh, this year we passed a medical debt reform uh, bill as well. Um, and so we've done a lot of good things. We passed, as, as Representative Kraft mentioned earlier, um, a gun bill this year uh, that increased penalties for straw purchasers, um, which uh, I think was a good move. Um, but at the same time, um, because so many of the straw purchasers are women in abusive relationships that are kind of being forced or coerced, or at least arguably being forced or coerced into uh, participating and going in without a criminal record, legally buying a gun, but for the purpose of handing it over to an abusive uh, a, a person that uh, could not lawfully possess, a, a, we included an affirmative defense uh, in there um, to protect, uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier by Savannah, to, uh, to give those victims um, a, a coercion defense, if you will, uh, to their conduct as well. Um, and as a part of that, and, and if it had been the straw purchase bill alone, that would have passed probably unanimously in the Senate. But it also included a binary trigger ban, um, which uh, I don't know if you know what a binary trigger is, but it's uh, even normally if you pull a trigger on a gun, it fires one shot. But uh, with a binary trigger, when you release it after you pull the trigger, it fires another bullet. Uh, so basically doubles the lethality of the firearm. Um, and uh, it was a loophole in statutes that defined um, these, uh, these technical provisions. And uh, we added that this year. And that was the one major uh, uh, provision to reduce gun violence um, uh, that was uh, directly passed this year by the legislature. Uh, last year, uh, the two bills that I authored, the uh, Universal Background Checks Bill um, and the Red Flag or, uh, uh, Bill um, uh, were also passed. So I think we've done a lot in the last two years 
uh, to directly address gun violence um, in Minnesota as well. No, no, no. no. I'm, ta I'm taking the opportunity to expand um, and to say that uh, uh, we've done a lot, some of it bipartisan, some of it uh, more partisan in nature. And I, I would add to that, too, and my biggest, one of my biggest frustrations was not having the ERA pass this year, the inclusive ERA. And um, when, you know, Chair Lee and Minority Lead um, Erdahl and then um, Senator Pappas worked very hard on bonding bills together, but then leadership has to make sure the votes are there, right, because it has to be, a, you know, it's a supermajority and they trade deals back and forth. And when they were leveraging the bonding bill and saying we won't give you votes for a bonding mill no matter how many of your projects you put us in, put in unless you don't pass the ERA, then I have a problem. And that was public, they were publicly traded offers, the newspaper reported on it, I'm not like saying anything out of school. It's when you bring stuff like that in that's just not necessary um, and matching up bills that like don't have anything to do with each other. So. We still have a lot of work to do, but I've served four years in the ma minority and six years in the majority, and I, I'll, I'll always fall back on it is about how you work together and the relationships you build. I actually did my master's thesis on the effective traits, uh, what are the effective traits um, for a legislature and divided government, and interviewed a lot of my colleagues on from both sides of the aisle. And if you ever want to fall asleep to 55 pages, I will send it to you. <laughs> but no, it does take individual work to build those relationships and try to make it function. And if we could just get rid of like, I don't even know, maybe floor limits will help um, part of the expansive circus or just like, you know, take some responsibility to not like always try to get the sound bite. <laughs> I don't know how to, make, how to make that happen. Maybe it's a matter of just getting to know each other a little better to understand. There's been a few times when someone said something on the floor that was very hurtful and I went up and you know, we had a conversation afterwards, and I think it just takes a lot of those conversations. This is like church, everybody's really quiet. <laughs> well, we are rapidly approaching eight o'clock. <laughs> All right. Well, I just will put a plug in for thanking you guys for being here tonight and make sure that you sign up for our legislative updates and um, follow us. You should know, though, since it's an election year, to be fair, we have this thing 60 days after signing die, which was May 20th, and I'm not going to do math in my head right now. We can't actively send things to you anymore. Um, we can respond to you if you email us, but we, we can't actively send because it wouldn't be fair to folks that are running. So just so you know, if it looks like we went dark from our official accounts, that's why. But um, still love to get your emails and get your thoughts and opinions and where a lot of us are doing community conversations throughout the summer and um, always like the input. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. And so, go ahead. No, no. No, I was going to say, I, w I was going to ask if we could do a picture, a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is, I left my phone in the car, so can you, you wanna do it, Ron? We can do it. Uh, you're actually better at selfies <laughs> than anyone I know. Is that good for everyone? Um, so, uh, is but, there a question? But, uh, be... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Oh, okay. You're more likely to get it then if you, <laughs> if you use your staff person's phone. I do this every one. All right. All right, we're back there. Wave hello. Great. All right, and in my uh, closing remarks, just thank you. Thank you to all of you for the opportunity to serve you, to represent you, to be responsive to your needs. Um, I welcome all the input, uh, those who agree or disagree with me on any particular policy. Um, it matters. Um, I, I take everything into account. I know we all do. Um, we get ideas for legislation, and it shapes how we decide to approach things as well. Uh, so you can reach out to us at any time. Thank you for spending your evening with us. I will say, I didn't get to say it, but I'm, I will say thank you. It has been an incredible honor to serve these past two years, and I really do appreciate any input that I get. So thank you all for coming out. <laughs>